Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I'm Paru Apple. I'm also with Baxter Healthcare. And thanks to Dr. Mackey, I feel like I have a whole new appreciation for what day of the month I should talk to Andrea Hunt, who happens to be my manager, about my raise. <laughs> Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our uh, keynote closing speaker, Dr. Kautar Hafidi, who, um, believe me, I've heard her speak before. You are in for a treat. Um, Dr. Uh, Hafidi is the nuclear physicist and the Women in Science and Technology Program Initiator at Argonne National Lab. And before she gets started, she wanted to ask uh, for all of you to participate in a poll. We'll help her in her talk. So if uh, you could just look at the screen. The first question is, why did you decide to come here today? You could text. Please uh, pick one. <laughs> I know maybe you have yeah. many reasons, but just pick one. I'll give it a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I only have two. <laughs> there we go. We only have 17 out of the whole room. Should 21. 21, okay. Come on, let's do 30. <laughs> let's do 30. <laughs> We're auctioneers, okay. okay. Okay, almost there. Okay, so a good majority came here to network. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I came also here to network. All right. So let's see what ask. did we get out of networking. My pause. Second question, how many promising connections do you feel you made here today? Can again, take a minute. Oh. So for the people that answered none, you have the cocktail hour to change that answer. <laughs> Wow. We're at 30. Okay, so you had two. Uh oh. Nope. <laughs> Statistics. Shit, yeah, really shifting before your eyes. Okay, one. I think I had one too, so that's good. Okay, okay sure. thank you for the participation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Erin and Rabia, for the kind invitation and for this great event. It's really uh, priceless to have such a venue to meet and network, and I hope it's only the beginning and we can, you know, more than just network, make collaborations for the benefit of women in science in the Chicagoland area. So before I start, let's give them a big round of applause, thanking them for this <laughs> Thank you also for staying. I know you are very tired, so I promise to be light if you promise not to sleep on me. <laughs> okay, so we had an exciting day. Uh, three sessions, networking lunch, and many of you had decent uh, networking uh, outcome. So uh, these are the polls. We decided to do them at the beginning, so we, uh, we save time. So I came here to network, that's my main reason. So I learned about other institutions and organization practices, and although maybe we didn't hear a lot, but we had a couple of institutions like Baxter and Abbott, so I got this. Uh, I came to develop professional relationship and friendship, to find mentors, be a mentor, share ideas, build collaborations, inspire and be inspired. So that was what I was expecting from this event, and I think it was pretty successful, I got many of the list. So tip to use at your next networking event. And believe me, I am very bad. I, I, I don't do what I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we have to keep this in mind. Do not spend too much time with people you know, which unfortunately I spent too much time with the people I know. Uh, it's best to initiate conversation with someone who is standing by him or herself. 
try to introduce each new person you meet to at least another person? So how many of you did that, introduce new people to other? Okay, well, great. When giving a person your card, you can write your uh, cell phone. Maybe they will feel you gave them more than a card. How many of you wrote your cell phone on a card? Okay, a few. <laughs> so do not approach two people who, they are, who are talking. Maybe they are, you know, having an important discussion. When you have a group of four, wait until you made eight eye contact with all of them before you just interrupt in the discussion. And when you meet someone for the first time, you have 72 hours to follow up. <laughs> so you have what to do, you, you know what to do tomorrow. Otherwise, they will forget about you. And the most important one, never approach people if they are working toward the rescue. <laughs> and we had a pretty busy bathroom. So. Okay. So most of you had one connection, which is great. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. It's a little bit exotic story, but it's, I think it's an informative story, and I will share with you what I learned uh, throughout my journey. Of course, I think I'm the least experienced of all the speakers, so I don't have 15 years of experience in research, so I don't claim that I'm really you know, the expert, but um, hopefully you can learn something from this uh, presentation. So one part, I'm a scientist, the other part, Uh, for the last two years, I have been the Argon Women in Science and Technology program initiator, and by doing this, this is actually 30% of my time. So it's not full-time a job, but I think I learned a lot, and I will share with you a little bit of that. So I am Moroccan. So how many of you went to Morocco? Oh, wow. Tourism is doing well in Morocco. That's good. <laughs> All right. So, okay. That, that's my picture when I was three years old. I just found it, I don't know how. So this is my journey. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be in charge, even at three years, but it's okay. <laughs> so I was born in Rabat, the capital of Morocco. I spent 23 years in Morocco. Then I went to France to do my PhD, to Paris. Uh, so I spent four years in Europe, and then I came to the US for 12 years. And I will tell you a little bit about this uh, three stations in my life. Okay, so just to be, you will hear music. This is a DVD, and I will tell you a little bit about Morocco. I'm showing you this music because it's Arabic music, and the picture of Morocco because this is the most beautiful thing you will see, but you will not hear <laughs> as beautiful things. So, you know, get this balance. All right. Oh, there is no... All right. So Morocco. Morocco is larger than California. Uh, north, we have the Reef Mountains. We have the Mediterranean Sea, north. And west, we have the Atlantic Ocean. We have Algeria on the east and Mauritania on the south. So we have the Atlas Mountain in the middle, which make the weather a little bit nice on the, on the coast borders. Morocco is pretty, as you will see. It's not Casablanca the movie. We don't live in white, uh, black and white. We live in colors. <laughs> uh, more than 45% of the jobs are in agriculture. We don't have oil, thank God. <laughs> We have 52% illiteracy. And in countryside, women illiteracy is 80%. Maybe we should. Okay, so we have 52% of illiteracy. And in the countryside, 80% of women are illiterate. So this is a high number. Uh, 30 million people live in Morocco. The majority are young. And more than 25% are jobless, especially the young. So the Morocco was the first nation in 1777 to recognize the fledgling United States as an independent nation. So that's history. We were the first to recognize the United States as independent. The Moroccan-American Treaty of Friendship stands as the U.S. oldest non-broken friendship treaty signed by John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. It has been continuous in effect since 1786. Again? Sorry. Sorry. Following the reorganization of the U.S. federal government upon the 1787 Constitution, President George Washington wrote 
a now venerated letter to the Sultan Muhammad, strengthened the ties between the two countries. The United States consulate in Tangia is the first property the American government ever owned abroad. So there is some kind of tie between the two countries. It's natural for me because there is only the Atlantic Ocean between them. When I was a little, I asked my dad, he took me fishing, and I said, what's after the ocean? And he said, it's America. So for me, America was the first fascination, what's after this ocean. Here, when I say Morocco, oh, you have beautiful queen. I say, no, no, we have a king. They think it's Monaco because of my French <laughs> accent. And then if they know, they say, oh, I know, it's close to Cuba. I love samba. <laughs> yes. So it's just if you go swim through the Atlantic, you will end up in Morocco. <laughs> so the, these are pretty pictures. Uh, maybe I can comment on a few of them. So this is Tangier. You can see, of course, if you visited Morocco, you know all of that. We have usually old cities surrounded by walls. And um, so it's so that's the Hassan II Mosque. It's one of the biggest after the one in Saudi Arabia. It's on the ocean. So in fact, I gave them one dollar to help in building the mosque. But when I wanted to visit, they say I have to pay ten dollars. <laughs> I say I contributed to this mosque. How can you? Anyway. <laughs> that's the... This is Casablanca, the uh, economical capital of Morocco. This is our twin towers. They are not very high, but. So, you know, buses, a lot of people, you know. This is Agadir. This city is south, near Marrakesh, but it's on the Atlantic Ocean. This is Rabat, my home city, and this uh, is Buregreg uh, 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 yeah, Buregreg uh, River. This is the bazaar. So if you go to the old Medina, you can go and buy artisanal. So a lot of, it's very important activities. People build stuff by their hands. So we try to keep it. These are, you know, usual houses. When we went to Morocco a few months ago, I organized the conference there. And Debbie, my colleague, went with me. She was picturing all the doors. She was fascinated by small door, big door. <laughs> so I told her, what are you doing? She said, oh, very nice, very pretty. Anyway. So those are um, uh, spices, which uh, make the Moroccan food one of the best. It's really very tasty. Um, this is just some. This is Marrakesh. This is south of Atlas, a little bit near the desert. Those are, you know, uh, they fold in in nature, those. Uh, uh, red uh, buildings. Of course, we have camels. This is the usual Moroccan tea. That's in every house with mint. Those are goats on argan tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, the argan tree only grows in Morocco, and it's very expensive for cosmetics. So if you buy cosmetics with argan oil, um, that's fancy bridge. <laughs> that's a big tagine. Uh, Moroccan is known with tagine. It's a Guinness record biggest tagine. That's the Moroccan couscous. That's the tagine, which usually is made in this, uh, you know, kind of plates. This is the, it's not bread. Uh, it looks like uh, Indian bread, but. This is the pastry. This is Mohammed VI and Bush II. <laughs> All right. So, yes, uh, so why I did science, in fact? So, I, I, when I was in you know, early age, I was fascinated by the universe. Uh, and I, in fact, I wanted to know, my passion was to know what God is made of. So I was always, you know, who created God and all those questions. So my dad directed me to, towards science. He said, you know, 
do science, you will learn more. So when I was in, in middle school, I was both good in science and humanities. And uh, in Morocco, we have to choose when we are 14 years old, very early, between the two. And there is no coming back. So either you choose science or humanities, and a year later you have to choose even, even mathematics or natural science. So it's really, if you make a wrong choice, it's, it's too bad for you. So I remember I made a humanity choice, and my two teachers were fighting, the mathematics teacher and literature. No, she better do that. So my dad told me, listen, first of all, Morocco is a third world country. If you want to help your country, you need to do science and technology. That's what we need. So he convinced me, and he said, Plus, if you do science, you, kept, you can keep writing. You can be a writer. But if you leave science and do only you know, humanities, it's very hard to do science at the same time. So I bought his argument to help my country, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I was very early aware of gender, very early. When I remember back when I was maybe a few years old, uh, I was told that my dad was not very happy because he had a girl. So I was a girl in his, his life for 10 years. Why? Because he has one, two, three, four, five sisters. He's the only boy. And because of the family name, you need a boy to carry the family name. So I was aware very early on of that. And I was not happy. And I tried to be, Daddy, my dad never told me anything. But I tried to be the boy for my dad. So here I am, even at this age, you know, looking like <laughs> Okay, so I did university in Morocco, and I chose to do theoretical high energy physics, particle physics, because I knew that if I want to go very far, I cannot do experimental physics in my country, because there are no labs, there are no accelerators. So I decided to do theory, and uh, I did. The problem is, when I finished uh, the university, uh, bachelor degree, they had the strike of PhDs without you know, because they couldn't find a job. So they decided to hire the 300 of them and close graduate school. That's the solution in the third world country. So I couldn't do my graduate school. Then I told my dad, I cannot. My dream is to be a scientist. So what can I do? My dad said, listen, I don't have money to send you abroad. And since the government is, you know, they don't reward the best and the brightest because I was ranked number one in my university, which is the biggest in Morocco, I couldn't have a fellowship. So what then? What can I do? Uh, it was very depressing. I told my, and my dad say, where do you want to go? I say, you know, I sent my application to Paris and they accepted me. This is a very good school. He said, well, are you going to Paris by yourself? I was 22 years old. Yeah, of course I'm going to. <laughs> no way, he said. I say, listen, either you let me go to Paris or I will burn the Congress and then I go to jail. <laughs> So, and he was really scared. <laughs> so he said, well, if you can find the money, then you can go. And of course, there was no money. So this picture is for my, from my wedding uh, 13 years ago. And you can see, I put it here because of this belt. This is a gold belt. It's made of gold. And it's heavy. So maybe it's worth $15,000 or $20,000. And this belonged to my aunt. This is the youngest of my five aunts. She is a doctor in endocrinology. She is a professor in university. She is a great woman. This is her two these are two her, her two daughters, but she, you know, she raised me also like a daughter. So she told me, you are going to finish your school. There is no way I will let you down. So in fact, she sold her belt and gave me the money to go to France. It was enough for that year. <laughs> the funny thing is that she sold it to my other aunt. <laughs> yeah. OK. So I went to France, to Paris. I was crying all along in, my, in the airplane. Because for me, France is the country co who colonized Morocco. And I didn't want to go. I, you know, I did everything. I studied theory, so I don't have to leave my country, and I could do good science, but, you know. So here I am in France. The first thing I was shocked with in France is, you know, people were not friendly with, with me. Because, you know, you, you see, in France, the minority is North African. And I look like North African. Here, thank God, I look Latino. So, you know. <laughs> I'm 
I'm always looking like a minority, fine. Um, so they, they were very, you know, I remember, you know, I was sitting in the metro and reading. Once I take an, an, a book in Arabic, then the lady near me will jump and run, run away from my seat, like, you know, I'm going to explode myself or something. Like that. <laughs> so the other thing in, in, in graduate school, all the kids were really, uh, they were atheists and they were very negative toward religion. So this shocked me. Because, you know, it's your problem. Why they should be, you know, I believe in God and I don't want to hear people insulting God. They don't believe in, in God, it's their problem. But for me, it was a big shock because I came from Morocco and, you know, it's not something. So I had to fight very hard. So I finished my year and then, of course, that belt paid for one year. After that year, the French government gave me a full scholarship, which made me even a queen. I could live like a queen and even send money back to my dad. So they, they really, I owe them a lot. So this is Michel Garçon, my, my thesis advisor. I gave him hell, you know, poor guy. <laughs> he, he, is, he is atheist, but he has a Jewish background. And for me, at that time, I thought that, Michel, I like you so much. I want you to believe in God. Or you are going to hell, what can I do for you? <laughs> And he was telling me, are you crazy? I don't believe in this. I say, you know, please just say you believe in God. So, you know, you, you'll be safe. Anyway, so, <laughs> you know, he, he really understood. And of course I evolved with time, but I can see myself so funny. I remember the first week with him. The first week he gave me a thesis and he told me, go read it and come back next week, give me a presentation. So I went, I worked very hard. This is my first week as really, you know, an internship. So I gave him a presentation. He asked me a question. I answered one question I didn't know. And then he told me, well, you should know. I felt so bad. I went home and I started crying, crying. You know, it, I really, it's the first time for me that somebody, you know, make this remark. Then, okay, i you know, after two years, of course, we did the experiment. I, I was analyzing the data. And one day I came to him. I told him, you know, I found this new algorithm for tracking. And I explained to him. Once, twice, three times, he didn't get it. And I told him, come on, Michel, you are my thesis advisor. You should know that. <laughs> and he was, what? I say, you see, how do you feel now? You are my advisor. <laughs> I told him, never say that to graduate student again. <laughs> so he was, mm, anyway. OK, and then I got married in France. My, my husband is from Tunisia. Actually, I want to show you this picture because when I was preparing, you know, similar talk, my, my son, I have six years old son, he saw this picture. He was, he was three years and a half when Obama was in the election. He told me, oh, mommy with Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I told him maybe it's the haircut, but it's not Obama. <laughs> And I said, enough for the French. I think I, you know, make them crazy enough. So I came to the US. And I came to Argonne. I was a postdoc there. And I have been since. So uh, it was a transition for me. Because uh, when I came to, to Argonne, of course, I was not, I didn't have Omar yet. And I, actually, I decided I'm going to wait. I was lucky enough because I got my PhD at 27. And then I came to Argonne as a postdoc. And then the French want me back with all these things. Then Argonne gave me a staff position a year later. And they hired my husband too, so which just was good at this level. So, but, but then they told me, okay, you are a postdoc, work. You know, do something good. <laughs> I say, what do you mean? You know, yesterday I was a graduate student. <laughs> now I'm postdoc and you tell me, okay, yeah, do good science. I say, so I work with them. He say, you work with whoever you want. Upstairs, downstairs, low energy, medium energy theory. Oh, okay. So I said, okay, that's really not, <laughs> not easy. So I went for one year and I worked with the theorist, Harry Lee, in our division. He is, uh, because he was the nicest person. So I went to him, I said, Harry, my name is this. And you know, they told me to do whatever I want. I want to work with you. <laughs> Free postdoc. He said, okay. He's so nice. So he taught me a lot. And in fact, what happens, I worked with him for a reason. Because we had a senior person who was doing a measurement 
to show something using a technique. I don't know, I'm not going to say details, but these are some nu nuclear pions. Part okay, I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> so, but he used the technique, he used an assumption to extract from the data this information. But this assumption we have to calculate with models and see if it's really true. So I was, I was always not feeling easy with this method, so I went to Harry and I said, I want to work on this, could you help me? So he helped me and we finished the calculation and we showed that this experiment cannot get any you know, um, logic results. And so they didn't get a lot of wind time and when they went for a new win to the program advisory committee, they get rejected. So that was bad for me because I screwed up one of the senior scientists because they leave me this freedom. Anyway, but I, I think he, I, he's a good guy, so he get over it. So, 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 so at Algon, I learned to be independent. So what did I do? In that year, I, I developed a proposal for my own measurement, and I went and I fought, and I got the beam time, which was actually three months of beam time at Jefferson Lab in Virginia. So at the end, I found myself that I'm in a good position. I started a new research that my group was not doing, but it was a synergy with my group. And in fact, it was very easy for them to, to promote me as a staff. So I learned this. Uh, I learned uh, how to, no, competitive, I am in nature competitive. I, want a, I learned about networking, and I will tell you a little bit more about that, but not in the first five years. Because when we are young and we start doing research, we think, if I'm good, it's enough. Everybody will come to me and worship me. Well, you can wait. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You have to be good. You have to let people know that you are good. You have to find collaborators. You have to find more than mentors, uh, champions that will pick up the phone for you and say, hey, she's great, hire her. OK, then I built a family. So I waited until I got my position and I finished my experiment because I have to go to Jefferson Lab for six months. And I bought a house, then I had a baby. In fact, I know even when. The, the day. <laughs> so it's well organized, thank God. I think I was lucky. <laughs> so this is my boy, Omar. He says he's mommy's boy. He say, I'm a mommy's boy. And he say, even if my friend laugh on me because they don't know you, I told them mommy is the toughest woman in the whole world. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what I do, not much details. So this is the scales from DNA molecule atoms. And until the lady quark, we have six quarks with flavors, with colors. So those are the fundamental particles. They are fun too. So I try to understand how from quarks we make protons, neutrons, and how from quarks we make quarks and gluons, we make nuclei. So that's what I do experimentally. And uh, it's hard, hard the field because all those quarks are confined inside particles. So the confinement make the calculation almost impossible because you don't, usually what you know to calculate is to make perturbation calculation. When the, the coupling is too strong, then you have to find clever ideas. So I do experiment at Jefferson Lab, and you can see here are two Linux and three experimental holes. Each Linux, now we have an upgrade. So uh, up, to, up to this month, we had six giga electron volt that we can send into experimental hall to smash the nucleus and study produced particles, and from them we can understand the dynamic of interaction. Now we are going to upgrade that, so in a year or two we are going to have 12 giga electron volt instead of six, which is a good time for us, although the economy is not that great, but. So this is the detector, hole B detector, as you can see, this is the human scale. Those are drift chambers which gets you the tracking of the particle, and I had to wear the, <laughs> the hat. So this is, we, we were, this is my graduate student, Rafael. He was uh, installing uh, 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 radial time projection chamber inside this, uh, this guy. So I'm an experimentalist, and sometimes you get rewards. So the experiment that I, I planned and fought for it and got in 2002, we just get approval two days ago for publications. And this is the 15 years of whole B. This is the whole experimental whole I do. And you can see here the results are featured, half of the space. And uh, basically, let me tell you in few words what's this result about. And actually, Lamia, uh, she's here. It's, she was my uh, graduate student, so this is her thesis results. So basically, we showed that, OK, you have an electron coming. This is the beam. 
This is the nucleus, protons and neutrons. So you can, in some specific condition, produce particles that comes from the photon. This is the photon. This is the, uh, the electron emit a photon. And the photon can become fluctuate into small size objects that basically become transparent to the whole nucleus. So you can really make the, 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 the particle go through the whole nucleus without interaction. It's like you, know, you shoot particle through the wall and it goes through. And this is, of course, is quantum mechanics, but we proved that we can do that and experimentally. And this is what you, you saw here, that the transparency, oops, the transparency, this is the transparency number of particles as function of the, the, the energy of the beam. So you can see that more particles cross the nucleus as we increase the energy, which means decrease the size. So sorry for, but I love so much this. <laughs> this is 10 years of, result, uh, of work that I want to share it with you. OK, work-life satisfaction. Uh, I would like, I'm not the, the real model for work-life satisfaction. <laughs> I, I think I have a work satisfaction. And my life is actually, I'm satisfied in my life because I have work satisfaction. But uh, although uh, I learned a lot when I prepared with the, the folks at AWIS. So AWIS, in partnership with uh, Elsevier Foundation, um, I went to a training that trained the trainer, and they trained us to give those kind of three hours, four hours workshops about work-life balance. So I just summarized to you the, the, the things that I learned, although I was one of the presenters. But if you are really interested, this is a nice workshop that we did also at Argonne. So OK, the first thing is set your values and priorities. You know, For example, for me, all my, my life, my dream was to be a great scientist, maybe a Nobel Prize. But it was not really a mom. So this is my priority, although now I don't regret it at all. You know, having uh, a kid is, <laughs> I don't think, you know, I don't have any, I think it's nature. Even if I was a, a cat, I will love my son. So I'm not saying that. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's nature. <laughs> Choose the right partner. I have a great partner. In fact, my husband has two kids, my son and me. <laughs> I, I told him, if he, wa he wanted to have a kid, I say, okay, I, I will work nine months, but then it's like FedEx. I give him. <laughs> and he has been great. He really, you know, he takes care of Omar very well. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Uh, um, dual careers, oh, it's a problem because if both of you are working and are traveling, this is a problem. It's, in fact, dual career is. A, women problem because statistics show that 30 to 40 percent of male are, have their partners in science male in science have their partner in science for women it's up to 80 percent i think we are not smart enough we just look around in the lab okay well let's get married <laughs> well for me it was true okay but it's also good because when you, have, you are too working, you can have more money and, in fact, hire people to help you. A nanny or you know, help you with the household work. So it's, it's good and, and bad. Uh, choose institution with family-friendly policy. If you have the luxury to do that, it's very important. For example, institutions that have daycare, uh, that, for example, they allow you to take a sick day when your child or your elderly parent is sick. I think those things account. Flexible time work. You can work, for example, uh, uh, you know, longer days, but uh, one less day in the week. I think at Argonne we have all of these uh, these things. That, but it's not depends on division, on place. It depends on your supervisor. Not everybody can use them like that. Okay, you have to planify very well. I think I, I after this workshop, I went and I start every week writing what I want to accomplish. Absolutely, I want to do. And then when you do that, you keep it in front of your eyes, then you can exercise your no, which we hear in this, you know. Some people come and tell you, could you please do that? You cannot say yes to everything, although we tend to be nice and want to help. But sometimes you have to say no or maybe offer less. Uh, but it's very important. You can only do that when you keep your, your schedule or your goals in, in, in your eyes, because sometimes let me look at my agenda. So I think it's very important to, to organize yourself. Also, when you choose your house, you know, make sure that you know, the traffic, you, know, you are living in somewhere, so you don't have to, to, to drive a long way. Cultivate a strong support network. Ask for help. You know, it's not asking for help. It's not doing everything. 
but if you can find people who will help you, that's, that's good. And last but not least, take care of yourself. You know, I, I like to cook and I like to do spa, you know, I like massage. So this is for me very rewarding. I, I know some people are crazy about sports, so you know, here you go. Whatever you make you happy and you know, renew your energy, go for it. Okay, now for work. For work, I think what is very important, because I know you are different level of, you know, uh, stage of your career, but start planning very, very early. Because really, when you, even when you start looking for your thesis advisor, you have to do your homework and search and make sure who are, where are those graduate students? Where did they go? Have been, the, are they successful or not? So by the first choice for your thesis advisor, you have to do your homework. Later on, when you are as a postdoc, of course, I'm talking about academia because I work at a national lab. You have also to make your homework. Where are those postdocs? If you work for a very powerful person that can, you know, knows that he or she placed her, her postdocs, that also is very important. Um, you have to understand your strengths and weaknesses. We all are very good at something, but not that good at the other thing. So you have to find collaborators that you know, matches you. For example, some people are very good at computing, they can write codes, others are very good at bringing new ideas. So you have to match the people who complement your skills, experimental, uh, at least physics. Uh, you have to understand sociology, it's very important. You have to communicate with people, to take time to go for lunch with them, uh, to, you know, make sure that you care about your colleagues, that you follow their work. Uh, whatever you think you can collaborate on, you should go ahead. So sociology is very important. You have to build connections and network, and this is what we do here, but this is a really very important work. You, you should not wait until you say, oh, oh, I am good, but I'm not advancing well in my career, and then you start looking for other people who are struggling, and then you want to network. You should do the network at the beginning. It's very important to save you, save you time. Uh, you have to choose your collaborators carefully because you don't want to end up working with people you don't like. Uh, I think it's one of the most rewarding things is to work with friends. Uh, you have to choose your mentors. At all careers of our lives, we need mentors. And men many mentors, not only one. For example, for me, as the only uh, women physicist in the physics division, there are not other women that I can talk to. So there are, I have great mentors, but they are male, and I cannot go and share with them my problem as a mom. I think they forgot even when they had children. So you have to look outside for, for, for mentors. You have to communicate, self-promotion, you know, go give, even, you know, you have seminars in your department, volunteer for a seminar. If nobody asks you to do a seminar in a year or two, say, okay, I want to give a seminar and, you know, talk about your work. Uh, be active in the community, this is very important, because really community is... But be careful not to be overwhelmed, because you need to do your science too. But you need to be active and care, because the only way to change your institution is to be involved. Otherwise, you just, you know, you get the things from top and you have to, to live with it. Uh, prepare the next generation of scientists. For me, it's very important. I am in national lab, I don't teach, so I felt always Okay, I'm doing my own stuff, which make me happy, fun for me. Of course, it's science that is useful, and, but I don't feel that I'm connecting directly to people. So even when I was still a postdoc, I brought a graduate student from Morocco. In fact, he was older than me. But even I was a postdoc, so people were telling me, are you crazy? You're not even sure that you are staying here. I said, I don't care. But I need to feel that I am sharing the knowledge with somebody. I'm caring about somebody. So for me, it's very important. Really, very, very important. So learn how to negotiate, uh, although I didn't do. They told me, we promote you as a staff. I say, okay, thank you. And they say, okay, well, you can negotiate your salary. I say, I don't do that for money. Uh. <laughs> but you know, although you don't care about money, what the speaker yesterday said, they pay for you what they think you are value for it. So just for my ego, I want them to pay as they pay for others. Even if I throw it from the window or use it for spa. <laughs> so ask for promotions. You go, I, I, I think for, for, uh, for academia, it's much more, you know, you have tenure track and tenure, but you can ask for salaries. At Argonne, we are not a public institution. We cannot know the salaries, but we can go and ask, so what's my salary compared to a distribution of salaries in my rank? I don't want to know names, but I have a right to ask. 
How long did I stay in this rank compared to a distribution? And in fact, we did that at Argon. We were four, four friends, and Christina is here, and we were decided, okay, let's do this experiment. Each one of us will go to her department and ask this question, and let's see what we get. So, okay, Christina, she was the previous WPI, asked, they gave her the data. I asked, of course, my division director came to me and gave me the data. Another woman asked and they told her, you don't have a right to ask. We will promote you when we think you are ready. The other division, they told her, oh, okay, your salary is okay, but you have been in this rank a little bit longer. Few days after that, she received an email, we want to promote you. <laughs> so it's like they forgot about her or what? So, you know, we send this information to HR and they make sure they send emails to all divisions that everyone has a right to ask. And I, went, I talked to a division director and he told me, you see, I was planning to promote some people. A guy came to me, I wa he was not on the list because he thinks he needs a few more years. And he told him, huh, I'm ready for the promotion. And just because he said that, the other guy put him on the list. So it's not because we care, we are materialist, well, but we need to ask about promotion, or at least uh, what should I do in the next year or two or three to get promotion? That's very important. You have to do that. Otherwise, you know, it's, uh, nobody will come and remember you that you deserve promotion. So this is Harini, the theorist that, that helped me, you know, this is the other guy that I screwed, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> I have mentors. So the, one of my mentors is, is Roy Holt. He used to be the group leader. He's the one who hired me as a staff. And this is Don Gisman. He used to be the division director. He's now group leader. Uh, they, he's great. Don, when he was division director, he used to tell me, you know what, we have daycare. You, know, you can have babies. <laughs> I say, okay. Yeah, we have daycare. And I think two years ago, I don't know, I think I got an award and I went jumping to him. Yeah, I have great news. He told me, are you pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> so it's so sweet, you know, for him, good news is, oh, no way. I still have nightmares when I had my baby. <laughs> okay, I have other outside division, uh, nanoscale material, Tiana. I have Christina, she's there. These are my mentors outside the division, and I have even Zinedine, he's from Temple University. So it, those are the active mentors now, but they keep changing with my needs. And I had previously others. Those are my kids. This is, those are my undergraduate, although now he's in Berkeley, he does string theory PhD, and she's in the University of Massachusetts. This is Ahmed, he was my first student. This is Lamia, she's here. And this, those are Moroccan, those are American, and this is my French graduate student, he, he just graduated in November from Lyon University. You see, they are not from, you know, American University because we are a national lab. So they, they, it's not easy to access students. But now he has a permanent position in the center of research, just a few, few months after he graduated. Uh oh <laughs> Oh, I didn't talk about WIST. WIST, Women in Science and Technology at Argonne, is a great organization. We are. We are a bunch of great women that fight very hard for women. We are sisters, and uh, I had the privilege to be the, the, the program initiator until May 1st, so I'm not anymore, thank God. And <laughs> it's tough. And here we, uh, we celebrated the 20th anniversary, and in fact, I, when I was looking at the picture, see the director, I think he was worried with me with the knife in my hand. <laughs> so. Okay, we do a lot of activities. Uh, first Friday forums, we meet uh, monthly, and here we have Introducing Girl to Engineering Day. This is every, in every year in the Engineering Week, we have 80 middle school girls who come at the lab to spend the whole day. And with each two of them, we have a mentor woman, scientist or engineer, and they build cars, they race the cars. So we have this, and this year was the 12th, 12th anniversary. So we have been doing that for uh, for uh, 12 years, thanks to the great volunteer at, at Argonne. We have also the Science Career in Search of Women, where we have every year 350 high school girls and 100 of their teachers and counselors. And this year was the 25th anniversary. And I just want to show you quickly that we made the video. It's great. We have a keynote speaker. We have uh, career boots. We have panel discussions, it's the whole day, and the girls really are, you know, usually very excited and they 
many of them decide to do uh, science. And our keynote speaker this year was uh, Katarina Rucci. She was one of the girls 10 years ago, and now she's preparing a PhD and MD at the University of Chicago at the same time. So 350 high school girls is a loss. So it's like a wedding. And then you feel you are getting old because all those girls are so young. I think by far the panels were really helpful and they were really interesting because I got to like interact with people who had hands-on experiences with things I would like to do in the future. The most important part was during lunch when we got one-on-one -on -one experience with, with the women working in the field. You got a more informal conversation, a smaller group of people to work with, and you really found out a lot about college and courses to finish off high school with. I think the students get a new perspective on what's available for them and I think they're able to see some of the things that they're learning in class, you know, firsthand and see how it's applied in real life. Oh, lots of them want to come back uh, next year. The juniors especially want to come back and go to different parts of it. So I definitely think it's a great opportunity for young women in high school, especially those who are planning on going to college but don't know where they're going or what they're going to major in. It was really helpful because before I came here, I guess my future was really hazy and I didn't know what I wanted to do. But after I came here, I really think I got a lot of things cleared up and I, people were here like enthusiastically answering my questions. All right, so. We do a lot of things. This is a workshop that we did for the 300 undergraduate students that come for the summer program. This is just a yoga session. We show them how to succeed and start networking. This is what we did as the work-life balance with AWIS. And more than that, more importantly, we really, because if you wait for the institution to do something, they want to advance women. It's not only retain, but also advance. So what we did, the couple of WIST women, we wrote a proposal called SHARP. Strategic Hiring, Advancement, and Retention Program to really have a program for many years to implement at the lab. I won't go through, but this is the Lady Sharp. Those are all the details how we should do it. And we are fighting with management because they have other priorities. But we already got the External Advisory Committee to review it and give recommendations. And you can see those very uh, famous women in that uh, panel. So as conclusion, I think we are making good progress, but uh, still we have to do a lot. To change the culture, we need the young generation. If you are not already, already involved, please join the effort because it makes us strong. Together we can and we'll certainly make a difference for the future generation. So everybody, not only women, everyone can reach their full potential. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the... Late. No, no. I think in the interest of time, we're going to hold questions for Dr. Hafidi. And uh, if you don't mind, if no people problem. could come up to you afterwards sure. and ask you questions one on one. Thank you. So, what a day this has been. This has been a very exciting symposium. Thank you to all of you. Big hand for all of you staying to the end of the day. We'd like to thank. We, uh, we're going to finish remarks briefly. Um, so just another round of applause for all of our speakers for today. They did a phenomenal job. Thank you, everyone. So we have just a couple of closing remarks. And first, Erin and I are representing a much larger group of women who spent the better part of 16 or so months to put this symposium together. They are listed on the back of your program, but we wanted to briefly acknowledge our steering committee. So if you are still here, ladies, if you could stand and be recognized. Veronica Ariola, <laughs> Suzanne Auburn, Heather Bihana, Annette Champion, Natasha DePaola, Lynn Narasimhan, Narasimhan, Donna Prestel, Ramil Shah, Sarah Shirk, Eileen Sweeney, and Peru. Where did Peru go? Peru Apple. <laughs> Great job, ladies. Thank you.
thank you as well. And what can I say, Kautar? You, you made me laugh. You made me cry. <laughs> um, but what a beautiful example of a woman scientist. And that goes for all the plenary speakers and all of you sitting in the audience here today. Um, and congrats on your latest research data and results that came back a couple days ago. So we will be following up with you in the future for future networking potential planning sessions or networking engagements. So please look out for those emails. If you have any additional questions, come to us at C2ST and we can funnel those to the committee as we plan for the next symposia. I will just want to make a quick uh, announcement about parking passes. If you need one, there's a gal outside. Her name is Christine with a black and white striped shirt. She will be giving you what you need. Thank you very much. And most important thing I'm going to say today, if you are a son, a daughter, a father, or a mother, happy Mother's Day tomorrow. Thank you.